thing after I trickle in as we get started. But this morning we have John Sharon, who is the Assistant Head of School for Teaching and Learning for the Carolina Friends School, and he's founder of the Disabilities Understood. And today he is here to speak on Job to Jesus, Disabilities, God, and the Church. So welcome, John. Thank you so much. And thank you all for uh, the invitation to, to, to be with you. Do, uh, some of you may or may not know Duke Chapel has a big place, piece of our heart. Um, and we, we worshiped here back in the mid 2000s, and then we moved away to Boston, and then um, you know, we're, we, we moved back. But um, it's, it's, it's such a delight to be with you. Um, maybe I can, we can start with a moment, a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you for um, this day. Thank you for the birthday of your church. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come before you and um, pray that you would open our eyes and our hearts to what you would have us learn today. Pray this in your name. Amen. Happy Pentecost, by the way. Thank you. Uh, so um, here's what I wanted to start with. Um, um, when you think about disability in the Bible, what comes to mind? That Jesus and all the people that came to him with some affliction asking for from their disability. Great. Thank you. I'll just I'll repeat that for the Zoom, I guess. Um, thinking about Jesus and and all the um, people who came to him for for healing, right? What else? The heart of God, compassion for them, like um, David, who had the heart of God and his compassion on the son of Saul, who had, who was disabled. Yes, the heart of God and compassion. Actually, we're going to talk. Uh, very simple. What else? Maybe one more. To put on an Old Testament mindset, uh, sometimes when you wrestle with God, you come away injured. Uh, yeah, great, great observation. Also, thank you. Uh, and so I, I, it's a, it's a, it's a complicated topic, um, and, uh, we're not going to have nearly enough time to go into the depths that I would like to, we'd be here like through next week, if, 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 uh, if, if we could really go into it. So, um, oh, sorry, there we go. Okay. So some, a couple of caveats before we start, um, one premise that I'm bringing to this table is that is that disability and suffering are not the same thing. Um, suffering is a is a um, a construct that that tends to be um, imposed by some people on others. Some people will look at someone who's disabled and think that they're suffering, but they may not be. Uh, we may we may see someone who doesn't look like us in in bodily form or who doesn't. Um, sort of think like it, us cognitively, and we might think that they're suffering. That's a judgment call, right? And so they're different, and I want to keep that keep that um, uh, in in our mind. Um, second thing I want to say is that, and some of you have mentioned this uh, already, um, Scripture is full of contradiction around disability. Um, there's a lot of compassion, but there's also some really interesting things that are not very compassionate, and we'll 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 talk about that in in a minute. And the third thing. Is um, is that the story of the church and disability is a really complicated relationship, um, and and my goal today is not to unpack all of that. My goal today is to um, to get us to look at disability in the church from a, maybe a slightly different angle, um, and maybe um, maybe to think a little bit about how um, Duke Chapel can be. Um, more welcoming even than it already is, and, and giving a, a, a wider sense of belonging um, for, for the people in, in its midst. So um, we're going to start with, with um, the, the book of Job, and, and one passage in particular. Um, can I get a volunteer to read this? Maybe they would need a microphone for this, I guess, although people on Zoom do have a handout as well. I think. I'll, I'll read. Okay, great. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, 
And Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied. A man will give all he has for his own life. But now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well, then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. Ashes. His wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, You are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Thank you. Before we... Um sort of launch into, into this a little bit. A little bit of context uh, is important here. In chapter one, you might remember that Job um, has a lot of his world kind of ripped apart, including the death of his children. And, um, and, and Job's reaction upon the news of the death of his children is remarkable. He falls to the ground in worship. Just fascinating. I give you that context so that for a fuller understanding of, of who Job is, was in, in this particular scripture. So I want to um, give you an opportunity to, to maybe turn to somebody sitting by you, if that's possible. And if you have to move, then that would be great. But here's what I'm curious about. What do you notice about this passage? What strikes you? If you were there with Job at this moment, how would you feel? What would you do? moment to think about that and then come up near you and and um and talk to you for a moment. I'm always disturbed by that. It almost feels like a John, would you go back a slide that had the three bullet points, please? Three bullet points? There's three bullet points of the, that's it. The scores yeah. are just, I think, for our new company. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Are you still 
or at least curse God and die. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's just say, like, you, I know someone who just was cured of brain cancer, and they're thanking God for curing them. But then is the well, inverse not true? I don't know what is there not, you know, if you if God didn't cure you, would you wouldn't thank him? I mean, I know you shouldn't. But 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 is it not a natural thing then to thank God, but then to curse God if, if you had to be a full illustration? Is the temptation that we, as human beings, if, if there was no one encouraging him to curse God, it would be like, give me another minute. Story would be especially if anybody else, you know, we all I feel like that would be a point. And he's given permission to curse his tragedy, and he's a man of great faith. And okay, he maintains that faith. That's one thing. But to have everyone around him here since he's been another one going. That, that makes it that much more effective. Everyone around him thinks. Oh, all right, I'm going to interrupt you. Sorry to stop good conversation. There's a lot here. And, and I'll also say there's a lot we're not going to be able to talk about. Today. <laughs> there's so much, right? There's so much here about sort of you know, for lack of a better term, it's theodicy and evil. Like, is God responsible for Job's suffering? Is Satan responsible for Job's suffering? What is this sort of idea of, of God sort of handing handing uh, Job over to, to to Satan to do whatever he wants to do with him, but not make sure, but be sure not to kill him? So, just a couple of quick observations that you had in your in your moments, and I'll just repeat them. That'll keep me make it easier than sending the microphone around. I think. Or you have two microphones. Yeah, okay. two Any observations? Thoughts? Oh, yeah, and he's also the runner. Okay, great. <laughs> great. I thought he was going to speak first. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I wasn't. I was just holding the mic because I'm the runner. <laughs> but Except, no pressure. And I had missed the first part, but I mean, there is that natural ability to uh, say if something happens to pray to God or to thank God for healing and then there I mean the, the inverse of that also is just there at least logically or at least you know why did God let this happen I mean so so it seems natural for either I don't know the person that's going through the suffering or the illness but at least those who sometimes it's even harder for those one person away or for the family of those than then two just part of the thought process, I think, for a lot of you. Right. Thanks. Somebody else? Yep. Um, I had some wisdom assistance from this nice lady over here. We both agreed that we felt uh, humbled and impressed with the faith of responding to suffering and, and what Job had to deal with. And that I feel that I've definitely never suffered for my faith, anything like that. So, thank you. Any more? Any more? <clears throat> I don't want to steal anybody's thunder. Uh, I want to call your attention to verse 8. Because when Job is afflicted with his sores, he takes a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. I think that's an incredibly profound statement and a profound action that Job does. Presumably, and I heard some of you sort of wondering about this um, in, in your conversation, Presumably, this is Job trying to relieve himself of his suffering. Perhaps it was it, they were itchy, the sores were itchy or whatever. But the fact that he would notice a piece of broken pottery lying on the ground discarded is really profound, I think. And I think it's the crux of this entire passage. Because Job, in his, in his affliction, notices something broken. More importantly, he uses something broken 
to relieve his own suffering. Not in a utilitarian way. I mean, well, for a piece of pottery, it was it was a utilitarian thing, but but there's this notion of redemptive brokenness that is jumping out to me. It always jumps out to me when I read this passage. I'm going to leave that there. We'll come back and talk about that if you'd like at the end. I'm leaving a little bit of time at the end for us to have some conversations. Um, so we'll come back to that. Um, I want to jump ahead to the Gospel of John. And the Gospel of John reading, um, it's not the entire story. It's really the beginning of, of uh, the healing of the man born blind. And wondered if somebody would... Um, Read this passage. It's also on your handout, so. Fallen tears. Great, thank you so much. John 9, 1 through 12. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. We must work the works of him who sent me. While it is day, night comes when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. As he said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and anointed the man's eyes with the clay, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which, mean, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seen. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar said, is not this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. He said, I am the man. They said to him, then how were your eyes open? He answered, the man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. Thank you. Again, loaded with lots of things in this passage. So um, I'm going to get back into little small groups. If you just joined us, we you missed that. So we're going to um, get into a little bit of time. And, and and again, what do you notice about this passage? What strikes you? If you were with Jesus and the man at this moment, and maybe even if you were the man in this moment, how would you feel? What would you do? Take a moment to think about that and return to your neighbors and have a brief conversation. The thing that jumps out at me is when the comes to be the What went wrong? Who who did it? I mean, it was almost like that whole then, we're still looking for uh, what is the cause of pain, what's the cause of suffering, the blindness. But they immediately went, I mean, so like, we, we still wrestle with them today in 20 years before, but they were wrestling with this here in 2000 years ago, and trying to find it, and in this case, maybe it was logical to still make that connection, who did something wrong, you know, but he's trying to go on, Okay. 
Maybe another minute. All righty. Sorry to interrupt. The thing I hate the most is when I have to break up really good conversations. Right. So I'm temporarily able to. Okay. So. Anybody want to share what you all talked about? Where the microphones are, there they are. Uh, so something, something that stru um, struck, me, struck me about this is that a um, well, couple related things. First, this man does not um, has to be involved in this. Um, that, you know, that Jesus and other people sort of see this person have a conversation about him. Um, and nor after, um, after he gains his sight, no one says, hey, you've been healed, or the man himself doesn't say, I've been healed, simply just says, 
I have received my sight. And we don't necessarily get a sense that um, he's overjoyed or, or that. If anything, in the last verse, it's, you know, that they ask, hey, where, where's Jesus? And he says, I don't know, as though he's sort of like, well, you know, he's not like feeling like he needs to be part of this throng following Jesus. He's a little bit more um, too, too sided about it. Right, and just to, 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 to pull out the context a little further, we didn't go into the, the rest of that, of, of chapter nine, which is this really fascinating conversation between the blind man who now has his sight and the Pharisees. The Pharisees are looking for Jesus, and they keep saying, well, but, but who did it? Where is he, and how did this happen? And, and, and it really, John, John writes this passage to really point out the blindness of the Pharisees, not so much the blindness of the man himself. And, and at one point, you know, he, um, the, the blind man later says something like, well, do you want to become a follower of him too? Is that why you're looking for him so much? It's hilarious. Um, so, so unfortunately, we don't have that, but that's a great, I'm, I'm really glad you made that point. Other, other observations, thoughts? And to belabor that point, uh, we ha how could the blind man know if he's seeing Jesus or not because he didn't see his sight until he walked away from where Jesus was. Yeah, exactly. What else? Yeah. What jumped out at me uh, with this when I was reading it was how powerful the idea is that a disability represents result of somebody's sin somewhere and uh, and therefore that person or somebody else did something that was sinful in the eyes of God that's a such a powerful theme that has reverberated through through time thank you for bringing that up I mean I sort of view this passage in some ways as like this is an Old Testament hangover of the view of sin because sin, sin in the Old Testament is very much sort of cause and effect uh, sin and the sin and disability like you sin, then you're going to be disabled, or whatever that might be. And, 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 I, I, and Jesus is like, no, 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 you're missing the entire point. But the other thing that comes to mind when you raise that point, which I think is also in some ways connected in what, what connects the Job passage, is that this is sort of, the, and the disciples want to know why, right? And I'm always, I'm always struck by why the disciples want to know why. I mean, who cares? Right. Well, and but but don't we all do that? I mean, I think that was sort of you were kind of indicating that. I mean, we all do that when we see someone who might look different from us in 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 a disability way. Uh, I know my first reaction, even as a person who's lived with a disability his entire life, my first reaction is, "Geez, I wonder what happened." And 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 I, I and I I think we do that, not to be an armchair psychologist for a minute, but I think we do that because we're trying to make sense of it, right? We're trying to be like, hmm, what, what, would, what would happen, what would I do if, I, if that were me, right? And, um, and so I think the, the why question is always a profound one um, to ask. And sometimes the why question actually gets in the way, as it does in this passage. It's not about the why. Jesus makes that really clear. It's not about the why, um, that, except that he says, so that the works of God might be made manifest. That's all he says, right? Um, which is can be, you know, interpreted in multiple different ways. Um, the other thing that's that's really interesting, and some of you, I think, I, I overheard some of you talking about this in your groups, was that that this this is a man, unlike some other healings that Jesus does, this is a man who actually participates, right? And um, that 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 you know. The only recorded notion that I'm aware of where Jesus spits, and um, and then and then he makes this clay and he and he and he puts it on his eyes and, and he says go wash it off and the man does, and um, and I think that there's a there's there's some profound ideas here. I'm not going to be able to really get into them too much about the notion of um, God wants us to participate. I think in our own healing. Perhaps, perhaps that is that is um, one of the things that's going on here. But again, in the bigger context, the, the, the notion of blindness in this story is way bigger than physical blindness. Jesus is really pointing to the spiritual blindness of the Pharisees. Right. 
Any other final observations before we move on? Well, I guess just to kind of go along with that, because one thing that's always stood out to me about this is the blind man didn't question what Jesus asked him to do. He just did it. Just did it. And then later when people are asking, you know, is this the man that was blind? Um, we were talking about how the man says, you know, he's telling them who did it and that he received his sight. He didn't say he healed me. So it's like, it's like the blind man was a little more wise than those around him. He knew Jesus gave him his sight back, but he was already whole. Right, exactly, exactly. Thank you, thank you for that. Well, so what I want to do now is um, is 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 do a little bit of a shift, although I think we're going to come back to some of this in a minute, to talk a little bit about um, sort of the the Old Testament and New Testament views this ability as we shift towards what's going on in the church today, sort of church writ large. So before we get there, um, and we've some of you have talked about this already. The, the in the Old Testament, you know, views of disability they're kind of contradictory and, and a little bit um, a little bit inconsistent in the sense that and I, and I mentioned the Levitical laws because there's there's pretty strict passages, uh, strict rules and regulations about things like um, whether the, the 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 any kind of lamb, for instance, sacrifice for Passover um, cannot have any blemish to it, cannot have anything wrong with it. Um, there's there's some New Testament, uh, or rather modern denominations who have used that passage to argue that that um, you can't be disabled and be a priest or a pastor. Um, Already mentioned about somebody already mentioned about the compassion, especially in uh, that David showed to Jonathan's son Mephibosheth, um, who who was uh, disabled, as you probably know, after Jonathan's death. Um, so there's some compassion there. Um, although I do remember Sam Wells once talking about the fact that maybe that was a political move, not so much a compassionate move. I'm not trying to throw Sam under the bus, um, but but. Um, but I, but I thought that was a really interesting that he really just wanted to keep Mephibosheth close to him so that so that there was no sort of other threats to, his, to the kingdom. I'm not sure about that. I'd much rather see the compassion side of this story than that. And then of course there's the Psalms, and I'm particularly thinking when I mention the Psalms about, um, for lack of a better term, the uh, um, in the Psalms of lament, which really reflect kind of the dark night of the soul idea. And, um, and, and maybe that's, you know, pointing to either situational or, or maybe even um, more clinical sort of times of depression and anguish and being left alone and being in a state of sorrow, right? Um, in, the old, in the New Testament, there's, we've already talked about there's healing and yes, there's also compassion. And then there's also this notion um, at the end of Jesus's life, of uh, Jesus as the disabled God. And that's a phrase that I'm borrowing from a woman named Nancy Iceland, who um, was a theologian, disabled theologian. I, I, I put it on the resource list. Um, she wrote a book with that same title, sort of liberatory theology of disability, and, and really looking at Jesus as the, the, the his, by, by assuming, by taking on disability when he's nailed to the cross is assuming um, a, 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 a disabled position that allows for liberation for all of us. I'm going to come back to that in a moment because it's a really important point, I think, to, to, um, to get a hold of. Um, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit because I want to, what I want to do is as we begin to think about the church today and what disability the, the relationship between disability and the church today, and that the church writ large, obviously, is what I'm talking about. Um, I think it's really helpful to look at, at, at the scholarship about what are the different models of disability that are out there. Uh, I'm not sure if you know this, but there's, a, there's, a, there's been an explosion of, of academic study in the last 10 years around the, in the area of disability studies um, all over the world. You can get now, you, now you can get a PhD in disability studies um, there's also a lot of really interesting things that are going on in the world of disability and theology. Um, in 2010, I had an opportunity 
to go to the very first theology and disability conference that was held at Gettysburg Seminary in Pennsylvania. And, um, and now that's a regular annual event um, that, that they've been doing. So, so I'm borrowing from the scholarship uh, on, on disability studies when I, when I, when I talk about this. So the, the five models that we're gonna briefly talk about, um, the medical model, the social or minority group model, the moral model, the limits model, and the cultural model. So the medical model basically says that disability is a malfunction of an otherwise normal human experience. And I'm putting that word in quotes. I'm not really sure what normal means. Um, it also implies that there's a condition in the medical model that can be fixed, right? Um, when I was in seventh grade, I had an opportunity to, um, to go visit a hand surgeon who said, who said to me, um, I can do surgery on your hands and make you look completely normal. And I'm like, well, that's interesting. Okay, tell me more. And he said, well, by the way, you're gonna lose 100% of the use of your hands in the process. By that point, I had learned how to write. I had learned how to play the piano. I had learned how to uh, swim. And he was basically telling me he was going to take all that away just so that I could look normal. That's the medical model in its flawed state, right? Um, it's the most common model by far. We, are, we all default to it. I do too when I use words like condition or, um, or something like that. The social model is it might de-emphasize the medical condition, but also but still focuses on impairment or problem. And, and it's sort of the, the, the normative society imposing physical and societal barriers, right? Um, and, and, and if you pay attention to people's language around disability, um, you'll, hear this, you'll hear this quite a bit. Um, and this, the problem with this particular model is that it lumps disability as a whole. It doesn't account for individual lived experiences and different lived experiences. It doesn't stigma fit into that social model too somewhere? Totally, 100%, right? Um, and it's a really hard, stigma is a really hard thing to shake, right? Uh, thank you for, for raising that. The moral model, um, this is where we find in some churches, uh, not all, but in some churches, um, in, in the US at least, um, the disabled are seen, being seen as punished by God or by the universe, whatever, uh, the disabled or their parents are to be blamed for their disability. Again, sort of the question about the why. Um, this is charity cases. I mean, this is the moral model was the, was the whole basis of the Jerry Lewis telethon notion. And if you remember the Jerry Lewis telethons for, to raise money for muscular dystrophy, he did really good work, but, 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 but it was very much sort of putting disabled people up on a pedestal and not really kind of individuating who they were and not really even thinking about that. So um, the, 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 the moral model it has, it has some problems. Um, and it leads to views of helplessness and neediness, right? Um, that, that might not be true. The limits model, there's gonna be overlap with these models, obviously. It, it, it holds that all human beings are limited. Right? We're all limited in our own capacities, disabled or not. Um, disability is just another limit. Um, the problem is that, again, it sort of denigrates individual lived experiences by lumping all disabilities together. Right? And then the last one, and this is the one that I want to spend a little bit more time on briefly because I think this is the, this is the model that I think is the, is the solution, I think, to the church and disability. Um, that, that it sees disability as a cultural phenomenon, and I'll unpack what that means in a minute. Um, it does away with the binary of able-bodied and disabled. If you're one or the other, I don't know anybody who is one or the other. Um, it uses the word non-disabled rather than able-bodied um, to reinforce cultural understanding of normalcy. And it individuates disability as a full range of lived experiences. Um, you can have two people um, with similar disability 
let's say, let's let's use visual blindness blindness for a moment who have very different lived experiences based on their background their family whatever right and this this sort of allows for that and it views disability and i love this phrase from justin hancock it, it, it views disability as naturalized and embodied difference see i, I contend that disability is a fundamental part of what it means to be human. Say that again. Disability is a fundamental part of what it means to be human. Uh, I've, I've done a, quite a bit of traveling and speaking and, you know, over the years and going to different schools or conferences. And um, whenever I talk to Uber drivers or hotel workers, when they ask me what I'm doing, I'll say, well, I'm speaking at a conference about disability, and they'll say, oh, well, I've got a child with a disability, or, oh, I have a disability, or, I mean, there are just so many instances of people that I run into when they're given the opportunity to acknowledge it, and permission to acknowledge it, um, it, may, it really has made me shift my thinking that disability is really fundamentally what it means to be human. And there's a couple of things that, that are worth saying here. Um, one is that we're all gonna get old if we have an opportunity to live long enough. And that will be a disabling condition in the eyes of the world. Um, we might, God forbid, but we might be involved in an accident. We might um, have, a, have a child or grandchild who is born disabled. Um, It's just part of our reality that we live with being human. And the cultural model of disability not only allows for that, but it actually gives us permission to embrace it, which I think is a really important point to keep in mind. And the other thing about the cultural model is that it allows for intersectionality to flourish so that it isn't just me as a disabled person, but but the other aspects of my identity are also part of who I am, right? Um, and, and that's true for, for all of us, right? So that leads us to, um, to, 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 to moving towards disability in the church. Um, you know, the, 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 the thing that I'm particularly interested in here is, is, is the notion of accessibility. And I'm not just talking about permission to get inside a building. Um, it's also accessibility of, um, of people's hearts, of, 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 of accessibility, of a mindset um, that, that allows for difference to sort of thrive and exist, to exist and thrive in, in, a, spiritual, in a spiritual home. When my wife and I were first married, um, we attended a church outside of DC that, that was an Episcopal church that had merged with a charismatic church. So let me just sort of let you think about that for a moment. An Episcopal <laughs> church that had merged with a charismatic church. And so it was a high, it was a very liturgical church. I grew up in the Episcopal church, so it was very comfortable for me. But there was also, also this notion of, of like the spirit was really alive and well. It's, it's appropriate we're talking about this on Pentecost. And there was a guy in that church, he was an older disabled man who was nonverbal. And when the church service was kind of getting going he would start making noises that were like on the one hand could be seen as incredibly disruptive to the church and to the service and to the sort of the order of things but if you really paid attention to when he was making his noises he was getting into the church he was getting into the service and it was just a beautiful thing it was just a and this was a church that embraced him and, and, and really saw him as a vital part of their, their worshiping body. Um, the other thing that, that, that I want to say here is that, that so many churches that I've seen today spend a lot of time when they think about disability ministry, if they have a disability ministry, it's usually ministry to. Ministry to the disabled or for the disabled. And I'm hoping that with a cultural lens, we can actually see um, to shift that to, to doing ministry with the disabled. 
because that's that's a really important notion here that this is disabled or not to be seen as as sort of going back to the limits model um, that aren't to be seen as needy or need to be you know sort of cured or fixed or or healed spiritually or otherwise it, they're just in our midst and and let's figure out a way to do ministry there and let's find their gifts yeah so I think you could even carry that one step further of disabled people ministering to us who are not disabled. Yeah. So, sure. Uh, I lived in Baltimore for quite a while, and I went to a church, and our associate minister was blind, a woman. Yeah. And, I mean, the, the Methodist church had embraced this woman. She went into the ministry and had church. She was at the end of her career when I knew her, but... Uh, she was an incredible preacher. I mean, uh, and she had so many gifts that were, I think, to some degree, developed more than they might have been otherwise by her being blind. And I'll say, I'll use that as an opportunity to say, I think the Methodist Church has been at the forefront of disability and leadership, um, more so than any other uh, denomination that I'm aware of. Um, in fact, at that Theology and Disability Conference that I, I mentioned back in 2010, there was a a pastor um, who had cerebral palsy who was at that conference. And then on the resources that I give you on the handout, uh, I've already mentioned him by name before, Justin Hancock. He's in Texas, and he's done doing a lot of really interesting disability work, and he has cerebral palsy. Um, really interesting, interesting guy. Um, the other point about, that I, two other points here is that, is that, to go back to the Joe passage for a minute, um, I, I Firmly believe that 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 the church um, has real opportunity to embrace um, the notion of brokenness in its midst. Maybe not suffering, but brokenness in its midst. Because um, because I think that we are all fundamentally, as a part of the human condition, we are not only all fundamentally disabled, but we are all fundamentally have brokenness in our lives. We we just do. It's really a, again what it means to be human. And because of that, I think that, that this notion of belonging is really important. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a guy who's done quite a bit of writing and speaking on disability and theology. His name is John Swinton. Um, he's, done some, he's, been, he's been to Duke before. Um, I think he's a friend of Sam Wells, actually. And, and, and I love John Swinton's definition of belonging. He says, you know you belong when you're missed when you're not there. You know you belong when you're missed, when you're not there. And I think about the guy who was at our church outside of DC um, at, that, at that charismatic Episcopal church. When he wasn't there, I missed him. I really did. Because I wasn't really, I was probably tuning out of the service. And he helped me stay focused. Because I knew that when, if he was making noise, I needed to pay attention. <laughs> really important. So I've thrown a lot at you in a very short period of time. We have a little bit of time, I think, for a little bit of um, sort of just have a conversation, questions. I don't know whether you're comfortable talking about this, but would you share with us a little bit about the origins of your own disability and how you were able to adjust to it? Thank you. Yeah, I, I had something in here. I was going to tell you my story, but I think we were going to run out of time. So thank you. I, if that's okay, I'll just briefly, I'll briefly, briefly share a little bit about my story. Um, so uh, my story is that I was born in 1964 uh, in Washington, D.C., and it, the, the, the condition, there I go again, use the, the medical model, the condition that I was born with, it's a diagnosis, uh, is something called arthrogryposis multiplex congenitum. Kind of a mouthful. Uh, arthro means joint. Riposis means curvature. Kind of makes sense when you see me. Multiplex means um, I, I sometimes joke. It means that my, my mom caught it in a movie theater. No, that doesn't what it means at all. It means in multiple extremities, and then congenital from birth. Super rare. Statistically, one out of 80, 80,000, 90,000 births. Um, so pretty rare. Uh, nobody knows what causes it. Back to the why for a minute. Um, could have been a virus that my mom had that she, when she was pregnant, that she didn't even know that she had. Entirely possible. 
Uh, even today, people don't know, um, don't really know the cost. And, um, and when I was born, um, six doctors said that I wasn't going to live. And they said that if I did live, I wasn't going to walk. And I would, chances were, this is the other thing that they said, chances were so good that I would be, and they used this term that we don't use anymore, thank goodness, mentally retarded that they told my parents to put me into an institution so that basically so that they could get away, get on with the rest of their lives, right? And my mom used to, the story goes that my mom used to come down to the hospital every day to feed me. And she'd make these little noises. And she noticed that my reaction was exactly the same as my older two siblings who are not disabled. And she's like, there's really nothing wrong with this kid's brain. So he's not going into an institution. Um, he's going to come home with me, actually. And then a few months later, that's what happened. Uh, and the way I, I tell, when I tell this story, I, 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 I tell it in a way that sort of, that, that says that it, for as long as I can remember, I knew that I was disabled. But my earliest memory, my earliest memory, I, I was being carried, so I didn't really walk until I was about five. I was being carried from a physical therapy session at Georgetown University Hospital by my mother. And we're walking across the parking lot. I'm four years old. And she's yelling at somebody and across the parking lot. And then she puts me in the car. She slams me. She's clearly really upset. She slams the door. And she's saying something about staring. Somebody was staring. And my mom was mad. That's my first memory. But at the same time, I also knew because of the family that I was born into that I was 100% not disabled. I was 100% just like everybody else. And the messages that my mom and siblings would give me mostly were like, there's nothing that you can't do. And we're just, you're, you're, we're just going to figure this out, right? Um, and so I, 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 I spent my entire life, and I still do spend my entire life, sort of navigating, be, be, be knowing 100% that I'm the same as everybody else, and also knowing 100% that I'm not the same as everybody else, that I'm different from everybody else. And it's sort of that, what I say, when I, especially when I talk to kids about this, uh, it's sort of navigating the world of same and different. I've lived in the worlds of same and different my entire life. Which is not to say that that's not true for any of us, right? We're all living in the world of same and different in unique ways, right? Um, and so, you know, for the first few years of my life, living at home, um, had lots of surgeries so they could straighten my feet and get into leg braces because I had a doctor who figured out that 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 I could I, I'd probably be able to walk with leg braces um, so that I could go to school and. Uh, by the way, I mean, let me go back to the to the six doctors that said I wasn't going to live. Um, statistically, I'm pretty sure this is true. All six of those doctors are now dead. Um, and here I am. So it shows you what modern medicine does. But, you know, I also want to say that I, I, I'm a member of a Facebook group for arthrogryposis. And there are, there are doctors or there are parents who get onto this group when they first find out that their child is going to be going to have arthrogryposis or, or does have arthrogryposis, there are parents who, who continue to say, 2024, yeah, I had doctors say that my kid wasn't going to live. Or, yeah, I had doctors say that my kid was going to be mentally disabled and that, that we should look at institutionalization. And today, 60 years later, which is kind of terrifying, actually. Um, so, um, Anyway, um, and then when I, the, my, the first time that I went to, I'm not going to give my whole life story. It'll be really boring, and, and we're, we're going to run out of time. Um, but, but the first the first school that I went to was something called, just think about the name of this school. It was run by the Easter Seals uh, Society. Um, something called the DC Society for Crippled Children. Not really a word we use very much anymore, um, at least not, um, and, unless you're disabled. And then you can use the word. I mean, there's a there's a movie on the on the list. If you haven't seen it, called Crip Camp. Watch it. It's a phenomenal film. Um, 
but but we don't really use that term anymore to, 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 for the naming of schools. And when I got to that school, remember that I had been I had really very much come from the world of same, and now I was in my mind entering the world of different because there were lots of disabled kids in that school, and 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 I look back on it, and I I actually think I was trying to get thrown out of kindergarten that year because I just didn't feel like I belonged. I, I misbehaved, I did crazy things, uh, I wasn't a mis I wasn't a badly behaved child, but. It just didn't, and, and I'm not. I'm not actually proud to say that publicly, but it's the truth that I was like, I'm not like these kids. These kids aren't like me, right? And and so then, for the following year, starting in first grade, I went to an independent school in D.C. where my my two sisters had gone, and um, and then of course, I really entered the world of different because I was the one who was different. And, and, and I didn't know that until all the my classmates that out, right? They took it upon themselves to point out all the things that I couldn't do or made fun of me or called me names or whatever. Um, I don't hold a grudge against that. Uh, I'm still friends with some of those people today because they didn't know any better. They just didn't, right? And it was their way of making sense of the world, right? Um, so anyway, that's briefly. Thank you for letting me indulge a little bit on my story. Other thoughts? So as you're saying this, I can't help but think about how your life would have been different if you had been born into a different family yeah. that didn't embrace you the way that right. your family did. Right. Yeah, I, I wonder that too. I have two wonderings. I wonder how that would be different if I was in a different family structure um, of, of some kind or a different family. I also wonder what my life would be like if I had been institutionalized for the first few years. And would they have figured out that maybe there wasn't anything wrong with my brain? And what would that would an impact that would have had on, on me? I mean, there's a very famous um, institution in New York called the Willowbrook, Willowbrook Institution, that that the living conditions of people with disabilities in that in that institution were horrific, just horrific in the 1970s. And it was exposed finally by the media in the early 1970s, and then it finally got shut down. But I, I sort of wonder, right? If I had, what would my life would have been like if I had started that way? Here, but for the grace of God, go I. I feel like I'm saying too much here, but I can't hold myself back. <laughs> uh, so I've done a lot of international health work. I've been amazed to find out that for people who have some kind of disability, their their family tends to hide them in the back room, and nobody ever knows that they're there. And it's 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 a terribly distressing kind of a thing, but it's a global phenomenon. It's it's so sad. Reminds me of the movie My Left Foot. Remember that movie, Daniel Day Lewis? If you haven't seen it, he's he's basically hidden under the back stairs, precisely because he's disabled. Um, very powerful film. Um, and then there are other cultures too, where you know disability and and sin are really intertwined, and um, and 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 that's that's a, there's a lot of people doing some really good work trying to turn that turn that around. We're running out of we're coming up against the clock. I know that. So any other final thoughts before we break? Your story about the nonverbal um, first go reminds me of my church, where there was a um, teenager a couple years older than I was who was nonverbal and did, you know in there uh, week in and week in week out, and you know seven on eight would occasionally have outbursts. And um, his dad was always worried, you know, like you know, is it is this disruptive? You know, sometimes he'd wait a little while, sometimes he'd get too much and would you know sort of take him out. You know, they sat at the same place every time. I, you know, Five rows back on a certain side on a certain side of the church, not not at the back, out the middle. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, yeah. but they were very faithful that, that that they were always going to come there. Um, I was sort of his brother. Uh, his brother was my age, and so we'd be in the same Sunday school classes and would fr 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 friends a little fr friends a little bit. Um, and I remember one one time um, talking to him a little bit and got the sense that you know um, you know. I, I don't know how we talked about it, but he was, um, he, he expressed how sometimes it's, it's, it's a little, little tough. It doesn't feel bad for his brother, 
but it's just a little tough because his brother takes a lot of work and attention, mm -hmm. and he and he ends up getting less of it. Yeah, uh, right. And you know that was that, that was sort of his reality with it. You know, right. It's just something that caught me recently. Yeah. No. Thank you. And I, in fact, I was just on the phone yesterday with with my sister, and we were talking about that very thing. We're you know just still trying to figure out like you know processing growing up and 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 what it's like what what it was like for her and for me and and um and and all of that. So, well. Thank you all so much for this time together. And I'll just say that the resources um, that I put up on that, I put on the sheet, um, this is not an exhaustive resource list. That obviously there's no way, but um, but it is it is certainly worth um, spending a little bit of time. And, and, and um, if you if you uh, if you have any interest, in stuff, again, thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming. Just a reminder, there is no class next week for Memorial Day weekend. And then the following week, the adult forum and Bible study combined. And we will be doing a topical Bible study this summer. So we hope to see you then. Thanks again. Great. Thank you all. Thank you.